Welcome into the Thunder Basketball Universe. It is March 18th. That's a Monday. Hope you guys already have your brackets filled out over the weekend. And uh, I'm here alongside Matt Pinto as the Thunder back and has a very rare three days in a row without a game coming off that victory out in Memphis by six points. And then, of course, the national TV win over the Dallas Mavericks last week. Matt, uh, just your thoughts on having this long of a stretch without a game? I don't can't remember a time that we've had that all year or maybe in the last few years. Yeah, and at this time of the year, I think it's just completely savored by these <laughs> guys. I mean, this is cherished time. They've got to get off their feet and just allow themselves to recharge because once they're back at it, uh, it's hot and heavy between that point and the end of the regular season on April 14th. So hopefully this will be a valuable time that they can utilize and it will show in terms of their performances. I, I could tell by the barks that I got from J-Dub and J-Will <laughs> that they could use these yeah. three days off. Yeah. They, they, they definitely definitely yeah. uh, had a little bit of that feeling of like, <sighs> I'm glad to yeah. be going home. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And look, I mean, it's an absolute grind. I'm still amazed, Nick, honestly, that uh, Chet Holmgren and Cason Wallace haven't missed a single minute all season long. It's, it's, it's remarkable. And the health of this team, which is a tribute to a lot of different layers of the organization for certain, but some of it's good luck as well. And, and we've had that all season long. Yeah. Not to put the cart in front of the horse, but they've got a guy in Shea Gildas Alexander who did play all 82 games of his rookie season to look at Chet and Kaysen, obviously uh, well on their way to potentially doing that this season. Speaking of guy who pretty much never misses games <laughs> and certainly has it for 34 years now, Matt Pinto, uh, we're, we're having you on today, one, for your insight, but two, this week on Wednesday is career game number 3,000 for you. And I was teasing the other day, you're like Wade Boggs now, um, <laughs> one of your, one of your uh, huh. former Red Sox yeah. guys. But uh, no, I, we, we want to talk to you about this incredible milestone and um, you know what this means to you and your career to be hitting a number like this, and I'm sure um, you know, 2,000 was amazing and 1,000 yeah. was amazing, yeah. but but 3,000 is just uh, wild. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's wild to think about 34 yeah. years. Yeah. Uh, it, it just because it feels almost like yesterday that it started for me um, being hired by the Charlotte Hornets at age 28 and then seeing what's unfolded since. Um, I would say as a child, I would have thought you know, that like the dream was to have this happen and to stay in it forever, to enjoy it yeah. forever and bring passion to it forever. But in reality, we know that these jobs are really tough to come by on this level. And it's a really tight fraternity and it just doesn't seem to turn over very frequently. That's yeah. the reality of what we we live in, in terms of the broadcast side, what the NBA is. But um, it's been a remarkable um, odyssey. It really has an, an adventure. Yeah. And, you know, it's one thing to be able to enjoy it for this long. And as you said, it's a, it's a one out one in system and you have worked for multiple different organizations. You've covered multiple different teams and that must have been quite the challenge and just um, trying to figure out all of the things that come with that with life. I mean, in a similar way to the players who are uh, often having to, to deal with that stuff. H what was that like for you having worked in so many different unique locations? I mean, Charlotte, Los Angeles, Dallas, and Seattle and Oklahoma City. Well, the thing was that I got hired into the league from Hawaii, where I was doing <laughs> University of Hawaii basketball, football, baseball, everything over there, and really have the dream and just heavily pursued that dream. My agent at the time told me, you're nuts. You got to get back to the mainland, <laughs> back to civilization, uh, where you're in, in a major college program to be recognized. And I'm like, oh, okay, I, I appreciate what you're saying, and I'm going to give this a shot anyway. And the Hornets, I'd never been to Charlotte, wound up hiring me. And um, so to see what went on there and to be part of what the evolution of Hornets basketball as Hornets hysteria took over that city and honestly that state for a period of time. Uh, and then they draft Larry Johnson. They draft Alonzo Mourning. They had Muggsy Bogues, the smallest player at that time who ever played in the NBA at 5'3". Uh, Steph Curry's dad, Dell, was a big part of that team off the bench, Kendall Gill. So they had a tremendous roster of talent and they were involved in the last playoff uh, series that uh, Kevin McHale ever played. He retired on the floor at Charlotte Coliseum. That same series, Reggie Lewis went down, and we know ultimately his demise began yeah. during that series, um, fatal heart issues, uh, and saw Larry Bird, um, you know, at the tail end of his career uh, through the course of that run as well. And the, the, the Hornets wound up winning that series in game four at home. Alonzo Mourning makes a top of the key jumper that seemed to beat the buzzer and end it, and they put time back on the clock. There was a lob from McHale, intended for D Brown and Kendall Gill went up and knocked it away. Would have been a dunk and 
the Celtics would have won game four and we'd gone back to Boston for game five. So um, it, it really stands out, all of that, as I remember back. And it, it feels like yesterday. It really does. I'm just imagining you leaving the, the shores of Hawaii, you know, maybe <laughs> maybe a little longer hair yeah, and yeah, you gotten yeah. used to being on the waves and, you know, uh, doing doing surfing and all sorts of stuff. And then you go to Charlotte and, you, and you've and you got this very first. Do you remember your very first game? And we you were doing radio at this yes. at this point, right? Because yeah. you've done, he, Matt's done TV. He's done yeah. radio, obviously. The voice of the thunder here on radio. Um, but you have so many different experiences. Your first radio game with Charlotte. Do you actually remember that? Yeah. Uh, the Scope in Norfolk. It was a preseason game <laughs> against Dallas. Alex English was still playing for the Mavericks at the tail end of his career. But what I remember most is that the roster for the Mavericks was about 23 players deep and probably 10 played. And so I remember the, the incredible prep work because I wanted to have every uh, I dot, every T crossed, all of those things to be prepared. Um, and the Hornets wound up winning the game big. Um, I remember just connecting with some of the players on the bus. Back then, it was still commercial flying. Um, there was much more of a just a, a general connectivity uh, between where I was and the players themselves. And so Richard Anderson played on that team, just a name from the past for yeah. anybody that, that's uh, tuned in. But um, I, I remember talking with him. Rex Chapman played on that team, talking with him and trying to get assimilated to what this was all about. I, I remember there were times, Nick, where the team would have played – three games in four nights. And on that day that followed, I'd be asking the assistant coaches what time's practice tomorrow. And they just laugh. It's like, you'll get it soon, but <laughs> that's not the way it is here. College basketball, very different than the NBA in terms of allowing these guys the rest time they need. Well, you mentioned the prep and having every I dotted and T crossed. That has served you well over 34 yeah. years. And just for all of you, I cannot imagine anyone being more prepared for any game. If you look at Matt's notes as, as he heads into each game, uh, what he writes out in terms of his game open, uh, everything is prepped and ready for him to be able to go out and uh, you know just execute your broadcast and deliver the type of passion and intensity to it that you need while you still have everything that you, you reference. Uh, has that changed over the course of, of, of time or have you had this level of, of prep from day one? It, it pretty much from day one. I think yeah. the thing I've learned is that when the Thunder, for example, see a team a second, third, fourth time in their own conference, it's a little bit less prep and more uh, less prep in terms of the structure of what I have in front of me, more diving into what's going on currently with that team. Because it's, I've said this often that it's not who you're playing, it's when you see them during the 82-game season because right. you may have injury issues, you may have different things going on behind the scenes with the team. It's important to be able to convey that to the audience. So that's more the focus now. And by the grace of the internet, we have access to all of those mm -hmm. things now in a different way than we did back when I started 34 years ago. So that certainly helped the process. But people still laugh at what I do because I've got two sheets in front of me that are long <laughs> sheets. They're like bigger than legal size sheets and they're all written out like hieroglyphics. I've got different notes that I make. I like doing it by hand. It helps the memorization uh, during the flow of the game itself. Uh, and people can laugh. It's all right. It works for me. That's, that's all that really matters. There's no white that you can still see on the page. It's it's remarkable. Yeah. And they people might laugh, but it's it, it absolutely works. And it's uh, an impressive sight to see this. I mean, the number of times that I've seen coaches and staff come back on yeah. the plane while you're doing it <laughs> and just there it, it's remarkable and i think it it lends a level of um i don't know either credibility or something there's there's a there's a sign of respect that i think a lot of people give yeah. because <laughs> you know yeah when we're on these flights at two o'clock in the morning you know, most people are passed out. Matt Pinto, he's still grinding away. Well, so, you're yeah. right there with me. So you're doing the same. You got your laptop open yeah. and there's a little light on over on the side. Yeah. I'm like, oh yeah, Nick's, Nick's grinding, but like usual. Um, but it, to me, Nick, that, like that's part of it. it yeah. It's not just the adrenaline of the game. It's the buildup. And, and I think anybody that's called football, for example, knows that's a week-long proposition. Yeah. But in the NBA, it's like you turn the page quickly. Yeah. It's like remembering back to school where you do a test, you forget about what you just had to memorize and grind to get ready for, and then you move on to whatever is next. And it's very similar in the league because in the next day or two, there's another opponent and you've got to quickly shift from how the Thunder did in that game to focus on what are, what are the matchups in the next game to get ready for. But that's part of what I love about what we do, yeah. I, I, honestly. And I, I've not ever had that tail off. If I ever do, it'll be time to go sell hot dogs on the corner or something, something yeah. else. Um, but I, it hasn't. And, and I'm grateful for that, for sure. What are the emotions that still run through you in the 30 minutes before tip-off of a game? I mean, do you have 
I would assume there's no nerves, but is it, uh, you know, anticipation? Is it, is there anxiety about what, how the game is going to go? Is there just the adrenaline rush? What, what's going through you? During yeah, I mean, there are instances of that where yeah. there's a game that maybe stands out more than others. And I, for a young team like this one, in my mind, and I recognize the team's not viewed it this way, but in my mind, litmus tests, mm -hmm. like how good is this team when they face some of the elite competition in the NBA? And by the way, they pass like a high majority <laughs> of those tests along the way this season. But there, there's the fan aspect of this that, we get to know these guys, we root for them, we see the work they put in, and we want to see them do well. So I think that's conveyed in the broadcast, I would hope and pray in a professional way, yeah. but I don't ever want the audience listening to wonder, well, which broadcast is this? Is this yeah, the Grizzly broadcast <laughs> or the Thunder broadcast? Yeah. Uh, and the other thing is that, uh, again, I'm not suggesting this is the right way to go about it, but if a fan is dismayed by something that's gone on on the court... I don't mind at least touching that emotion in terms of how I'm projecting what's happening, even around officiating. Yeah. I think there's a way to do that and a way to maybe pull it back sometimes. But I want the audience to feel a connectivity on radio that I think as kids, we grew up listening to radio right. and, and having that imagination stimulated. I want to be able to serve in that role in some way. I take the responsibility pretty seriously. And I think that's part of it, the entertainment uh, value of it. All right. Before we transition to what you were just touching on about the Thunder passing a lot of tests so far this year, I want to get two things from you. A, a game that stands out to you in your career prior to joining the Thunder and then a game with the Thunder uh, that really stands out to you and maybe uh, why that's indicative of your experience here with the, the organization. Yeah, I would say it's game four for Charlotte against the Celtics because all of those things happen in that series and then it culminates in uh, the Hornets blowing a huge fourth quarter lead to Boston with a chance to put them away. This is still the legendary Celtics. They had components of teams that had won multiple championships and the Hornets were that young rising team at that point and to win that game, the way it happened, the drama of it, I'll never forget. And, and I would say you got to go back to the 2012 run for this team to yeah. the NBA Finals. And the game that stands out um, is game six at home because yeah. the Thunder was down big at halftime. Uh, and you're sitting there thinking, oh, man, got to go back to game seven to San Antonio. <laughs> All that with Tim Duncan and Tony Parker and Manu Ginobili and the legend of what that organization was all about. And the team just comes out on fire in the third quarter, is leading after three. And then it was just this like uh, elementary school celebration down the stretch of game six where the players are a slapping fives and smiling with the fans around the brim of the, uh, the base of the arena. It was just one of those spectacular, extraordinary moments that it was captivating. Like you'll never not remember that as a fixture in what this organization has been about, what the fan base and their adoration of this organization has been. It was all there in living color to experience. So that absolutely jumps out for me as well. I mean, what a special moment in this building. And I'll never forget uh, Perk's dunk yeah. at the very end, the dish yeah. from, from Duran. And uh, you, you hear from guys who have been through this place and that game, despite the careers that they've had beyond this, they they mentioned that game as being um, a, a huge, huge moment, if not the most important moment of their careers uh, and, and something that kind of sticks with them as well. So, um, Matt, awesome uh, to, <laughs> to have you break down um, this remarkable career that continues on past 34 years yeah. and just is um, incredible what you've done and put together and the way that you've been able to share the joy, the intensity, the fervor of Thunder basketball. We're going to talk a little bit more about this season here in just a minute, but we're going to take a quick break before that. We'll be right back. What a rebound from Dort. Floats it up there. It's Chet Holmgren to spike it down. The fight from this Memphis team. And good help defense. Kenrich Williams came over, took it right away from Jackson Jr. J Dub, little sidestep. Jalen Williams scores with the scoop. Back up the key into the fourth grade, coming home, coming out of recess. Just walked the ball up and run some time off this clock. Nice cut. Case and Wallace right across the baseline, slams it down. Okay, we are back here at Paycom Center with Matt Pinto and the Thunder has this great little stretch of three days off, but coming off the win in Memphis, which was uh, a really great test for this Thunder team. You just, it had trap game written all over it in terms of having the days off coming up. The the game against Dallas a couple days before that was on national television. This has been a slog and a grind really since the All-Star break. And Memphis was going to be hungry after having lost to the Thunder a week prior. They had Desmond Bain back, Jaron Jackson Jr. What did you make of the way that the Thunder was able to finish out that game? 
and just not allow Memphis to make a finishing run or a run that uh, was really able to turn momentum throughout the game. Yeah, Mark Dagnall constantly talks about maybe not having your best stuff, your fastball that night. I didn't think the Thunder did, especially defensively. But to me, the mark of a team that you know is bound together, believes in itself, is to find a way to persevere on nights like that. Uh, And I reflect back on a similar scenario against Portland, a team they'd beaten by 62 like two weeks prior. And the Blazers led, I'm going to say, like 90% of that following game at Paycom Center. Yet the Thunder found a way to resourcefully win it by two. I I think that the mark of quality teams is that, yes, you've got hiccups at certain moments. Nothing's going to be perfect. Mark Dagnall, fully embraces that. I think this team does, but they find a way. They're about winning. And and that really is what stands out to me about that specific instance. I like the fact that Desmond Bame is back and played yeah. well. It was terrific. I, it was great for the league. It's good for that organization in Memphis. And it's good for the Thunder to be challenged at different turns. It really will equip them for what's ahead from here. And Taylor Jenkins, very talented coach, no who threw a lot of different things at the Thunder throughout the night. And the execution late really stood out. There was one play in particular that really helped seal the game where the trap came out on high on J-Dub, which is a whole nother story that the fact that he's starting to see some of these same coverages that Shea has been seeing. And that pass goes into the pocket for Chet Holmgren and Chet completely instinctually is able to to flip over his right shoulder and find Cason Wallace, his fellow rookie, cutting baseline. What did that moment maybe signify to you about some of the things that if you go back to the beginning of the season, the Thunder has been able to work through and solve together. I love the fact that, as I mentioned a minute ago, Nick, that they've been challenged in the ways yeah. that they have because teams have game planned for them uniquely, differently, throwing different looks at them consistently. I think they've taken a minute to adapt and adjust, but to their credit, in most instances, in real time on the fly, they're adjusting effectively. And that was another moment where Taylor Jenkins tried to throw a curveball at them. They reacted instinctually, given their past experiences, responded. But the thing I loved most was the rookie-to-rookie exchange to complete the play. Uh, Chet immediately finds Kaysen, who makes the right cut where there was space and availability. Kaysen didn't delay, didn't hesitate, dunked. And that, for the most part, ended the drama of the night. That, That was it. The door slammed there. So I just think that this team belies the the chronology on the roster in terms of the ages of these guys. They just find ways. And and it's because, to me, they are so focused on being competitive to win, not agendized to individual numbers and stats. But those things are all coming for them, which is so interesting. I mean, Chet, uh, since January 1st, has three or more assists in like two-thirds of his games. I mean, just he's continuing to round himself as a player. He picked up his 20th double-double of the season. Uh, There's only 10 rookies who have done that over the last 10 years. So um, he's in, you know, continues to be in good company and definitely a a part of those conversations as we come down the stretch of the season uh, about whether he might be, you know, the rookie of the year. What have you seen from Chet this season that um, in the scope of your career makes him different as a rookie? I think that it's that he had... Absolutely built up, um, I think, enough uh, stuff in his career entering the NBA to feel as if there was some level of entitlement around him as to how he'd be fed the ball, where he'd be fed the ball, uh, and, and maybe insert his will into what the Thunder are. He's been additive in everything yeah. he's done. There's been not a seam that, that's that been uh, challenged by how he's shown up, how he's played, the fact that he hasn't forced things. There are nights he takes five, six shots. He's totally good with that. The team wins the game because he impacts it in so many different ways. That stands out to me more than anything else. And Nick, I, this may be very soapbox-ish, but to me, the Rookie of the Year vote shouldn't be close in Chet's favor. Yeah. Uh, because we, we, when you look back over the last 15 years in this league, Uh, rookies of the year have improved their team's win status versus the previous year. Wemby won't do that. And I hear this argument from some of the players in the league. Paul George made this statement that Wemby Yama has no one around him, so there's more pressure. I would beg to differ. I think when you've got a team that is upwardly mobile fighting for high seeding in a conference – it would be perceived there's more pressure for you to do your job at a high level to sustain that. Wemin Yama can throw numbers up, but it's not impacting anything in the standings. So it's not a discredit to him. He's in the situation he's in. Chet's in the situation he's in. But Chet does so many things so well, has impacted the way other teams defend the Thunder. People talk about playing off of Josh Giddy. Well, that's happening because of Chet's presence, his pick and pop ability in the offense. And they've got to account for him somehow uniquely, which is rare in this league. So I just think he's such a unique talent, but he has not been disruptive to anything this team does 
team does it. He's been additive. And to me, with the numbers he's put up and the, the consistency he's delivered for a team that's at 47 and 20 right now, this is not much of a contest in my eyes. The thing I asked Chet about post game in Memphis, and I also asked J Dub about this too, is the restraint that Chet has shown so far this season. I mean, he, he had a 20 and 10 night, but nothing was forced in that game yeah. in Memphis. And J Dub said it pretty clearly. He's like, when you are a highly talented competitor and the thing that you care most about is winning, for a guy like Chet, he th- that restraint comes absolutely naturally. And, and it's remarkable to see the level of restraint because Chet could certainly be going out and trying to gun for this award. No doubt. And he hasn't done that in the slightest. Yeah. Uh, I, you look to the game at Golden State where he makes the um, curl cut three from the wing to force overtime. That's a night when the Thunder needed him yeah. to be big and bold and make the plays he made. He had 36 points, a career high, but those were needed in those moments. And ultimately, the team wins an overtime game against the Warriors on the road in San Francisco. He's an enormously impactful uh, presence in that process. And Uh, I continue to marvel at what he does consistently from game to game. The other area he shows restraint, Nick, is that teams are trying to physically bully him, yet he is not coward. He does not step away from those challenges. He doesn't get into it with opposing players. He's very sportsmanlike in the way he does that. Anytime he looks to Mark Dagnall and twirls his finger, like challenge that call, Mark is believing, he's trusting, because Chet doesn't do that just offhandedly. He really has a grounded emotional base that serves him as an NBA player at 21 in his rookie season. Incredibly impressive. He hasn't let any of this get to him. I mean, no. Yusuf Nurkic's arm is basically like a tree trunk, and it whacked him right in the face yeah. in Phoenix. No problem, whatever. Bounce, you know, bounce back off of it, keep playing, and the Thunder, you know, goes and takes care of business. It's just like This is some stuff that we've seen from Chet all year that uh, demonstrates the ability for these guys to be able to just trust him in every situation. But I think there's a tone set from Shea in in terms of the restraint as well. I mean, the last two games are a perfect example. I mean, he's been a metronome of 30-point scoring Mm -hmm. this year. But against Dallas and against Phoenix on the road, it hasn't quite been there for him. He's just making the next play. And when he's gotten doubled, I mean, you talked about the way that teams are guarding right now where they're they're really trying to uh, reorient things so that they don't have a big man on Chet. Well, we've seen all sorts of other exotic coverages this year as well. Double teams on Shea way out at the, at the midcourt line. We've seen zone defenses that are primarily predicated to try to keep Shea out of the lane. Box and ones Box against him, yeah. Yeah, I mean, all of this stuff. And Shea is just taking whatever the defense gives. Yeah, and I think that's his character one because again he has talked uh not loudly but in his more soft toned way striving to be the best player in the world we see that track continue it's it's upwardly mobile it's consistent um it's remarkable in in its scope but it's within the scheme of the team and again the reason this team has the record it has is because you have players that are unselfish that are about winning and that's the absolute number one priority and they bring this and and people get tired of hearing it but zero zero mentality into every scenario not just game to game and day to day but possession to possession and i think shea embodies that and exemplifies that he's willing to diagnose what's the defense doing this time up the floor what's the right play that i have to make in order to assist and move my team forward he does it remarkably he really does and now 48 games of at least 30 points or more so far this season that breaks the record set by kevin durant here in oklahoma city there's another record i believe 57 is the number that james harden got to uh as an nba record for a number of uh games with at least 30 points in the sort of the modern era so we'll see if shea's able to to hit that number here over the last 15 games of the regular season uh you mentioned the zero and zero mentality We all know who that comes from, uh, Mark Dagnalt. You spend more time with Mark than maybe anybody. I mean, you get that that great one-on-one opportunity before every game. What are those moments like between you and Mark, the opportunity to sit down with him before the, the <laughs> yeah. recorder goes on and then and then yeah. uh it once it once that fires up too well i joke with him all the time my vocabulary improves every time i talk to him <laughs> so i'm i feel like i'm going into the arena that night after visiting with him and i'm fortified with yeah. what i have to deliver that night. maybe some different terminology different yeah. phraseology that mark comes up with he's incredibly intelligent that's very evident uh he has i think um, a perspective on the game that's fresh it's creative it's unique um i think that 
stands out without question, but he's so authentic, Nick. He's just a, a real person that's very grounded, is grateful for the opportunity he has on this level. He never lets anybody forget that, that that's kind of the approach he takes. But I think that it would be foolhardy on our part to not recognize how good this offense is, yeah. how good this defense has become because of the structure he's laid out. Uh, there are different concepts that opposing coaches look at and say, man, this guy's really good. And I think when you get that from coaches that have been in the league for decades, Eric Spolstra said that after he came back and led this Thunder team to a win in, in a game that was Miami pace dictated, right. 107-100, uh, but Degnault's been able to adjust what this team has to do to be effective that night. That's an incredible skill set that he has, but the interpersonal relationships he has with his players gets complete buy-in. I think he holds an accountability with them. They no longer question. They get and understand where the bar is set, and if they're not in that range of the bar, they recognize they're going to come back, have a quick seat, get themselves to that level, and get back out there. But um, I think there's nothing about him that isn't remarkable um, and that isn't um, something that stays with you because he's unique in the way that he approaches his job. Uh, I think that you can't help but root for him. And to me, he is the de facto coach of the year in the NBA this season. And he's not even 40 years old yet. And yeah. yet there's so much that you learn from Mark every day, just the way that he thinks about the game. For those of us in, you know, that have been around for quite a long time, he can help mold your mind a little bit with just some of these little phrases. I mean, he talked about competitive empathy, yep. right? I mean, the opportunity to be thinking about what your opponent might be thinking mm -hmm. heading into the game or feeling heading into a game. Uh, so many little different phrases uh, that, you, that you, I'm sure, have heard as well. Yeah, I, I'm, you hear the players use them like, right. get the car back on the road. Yeah. That's one of Mark's great phrases. Yeah. The other thing about him, Nick, that's unique is that I think that coaches on this level can be very insecure. You don't get that from him at all. And he not he doesn't just dive into the areas of default from a previous game or games. He focuses on the strengths and says, we need to continue to build those right. because we've proven we're pretty good in certain areas. We don't want to lose sight of that and just dive in solely to areas maybe where we need to continue to grow and pick things up. That's unique as well in my experience in this league. Another Markism, don't chase your tail, yeah. you know, and, yeah. and don't chase your shadow are two different things that he's talked about. And uh, pressing your advantage when you have one is absolutely something that uh, some NBA coaches miss the mark on and, and forget that, hey, we, there's a reason why we're good. Yeah. We got to double down on that as well. So um, really uh, impressive stuff from Mark. You know, he's got these great phrases. I don't think any of them will rival what I heard when I was with the New York Jets when Rex Ryan said, <laughs> that guy could throw a strawberry through a battleship. <laughs> oh, but man. but uh, Mark certainly uh, definitely has a, has a turn of phrase. Yeah. You know? yeah. No, he, he does. And, and like I said, it's just the, the way that he – you know, utilizes his vocabulary to make points and make them uniquely and fresh. You hear so much of the coach jargon, yeah. but being around Mark, um, it just, it, it's, it's a joy. Um, I look forward to it before every game and every time we have an opportunity to interact for sure. And most importantly, it connects with the players and mm -hmm. you hear the players saying these things as well. And Mark has talked about, you know, this has to be authentic and it has to ring true and be real to the guys. If it's hollow to them, then it's nonsense. Yeah. But uh, Mark is very intentional about the way that he approaches this to make sure that the players feel like there's credibility behind everything that he's saying to them. Um, and, and that's something that he's done at a magnificent level. So um, thank you, Matt, so yeah. much for, for coming on, breaking all of this down. Let's just let the, the folks know about what's coming up here. Obviously, uh, the big game on Wednesday, the Thunder is going to have a chance to host the Utah Jazz. Uh, that'll be Matt's 3,000th career game, um, calling that game on radio here, WLS Sports Animal and the Thunder Radio Network. And then after that, a, a three-game trip on the road, Toronto, Milwaukee, who the Thunder is going to see for the first time, and then down to New Orleans. Uh, what do you make of this little four-game stretch coming up? Well, I think that they've got to stay true to their identity. Mm -hmm. They've got to utilize this time away in a way that both bolsters them because they are now entering the stretch run. We've talked about it, the anticipation of it. Inside the final month, I think you perceive as the stretch run. And the caliber of competition is not going to fall off once they get through Toronto. Now, Utah and Toronto both have different things going on with their squads. They're not maybe yeah. at full strength for different reasons. But Milwaukee will be with Chris Middleton back now. Uh, Dame Lillard had a huge game and a win over Phoenix over the weekend. And then the New Orleans Pelicans playing as well as any team in the Western Conference. I think they'll feel like they owe the Thunder one. Last time the two met in the Big Easy, Thunder won handily. Uh, so these are challenges. But this team 
team, to its credit, I mentioned this earlier, um, I think Boston's the only team that's beaten more teams that are at or over 500 in terms of the schedule they played to this point. So these guys love these challenges. They rise, they are in the competitive fire, and that's where they thrive. Well, the Thunder's certainly going to have a lot of chances to maybe sneak past the Celtics on that front. Ten yeah. out of the final 13 opponents for the Thunder above 500 this season. So uh, thank you so much for joining us, Matt. Thank you all so much for tuning in. Uh, be sure to like, rate, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And until next time, Thunder up and catch you later.